Chapter 17 of Around the World in Eighty Days. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towel. Chapter 17 Showing What Happened on the Voyage from Singapore to Hong Kong. The detective and Passepartout met often on deck after this interview though Fix was reserved and did not attempt to induce his companion to divulge any more facts concerning Mr. Fogg. He caught a glimpse of that mysterious gentleman once or twice, but Mr. Fogg usually confined himself to the cabin where he kept Aouda company, or, according to his inveterate habit, took a hand at whist. Passepartout began very seriously to conjecture what strange chance kept Fix still on the route that his master was pursuing. It was really worth considering why this certainly very amiable and complacent person, whom he had first met at Suez, had then encountered on board the Mongolia, who disembarked at Bombay, which he announced as his destination, and now turned up so unexpectedly on the Rangoon, was following Mr. Fogg's track step by step. What was Fix's object? Passepartout was ready to wager his Indian shoes, which he religiously preserved, that Fix would also leave Hong Kong at the same time with them, and probably on the same steamer. Passepartout might have cudgelled his brain for a century without hitting upon the real object which the detective had in view. He never could have imagined that Phileas Fogg was being tracked as a robber around the globe, but as it is in human nature to attempt the solution of every mystery, Passepartout suddenly discovered an explanation of Fix's movements, which was in truth far from unreasonable. Fix, he thought, could only be an agent of Mr. Fogg's friends at the Reform Club, sent to follow him up, and to ascertain that he really went round the world as had been agreed upon. "'It's clear,' repeated the worthy servant to himself, proud of his shrewdness. "'He's a spy sent to keep us in view. That isn't quite the thing, either, to be spying Mr. Fogg, who is so honorable a man. Ah, gentlemen of the Reform, this shall cost you dear.' Passepartout, enchanted with his discovery, resolved to say nothing to his master, lest he should be justly offended at this mistrust on the part of his adversaries. But he determined to chaff Fix, when he had the chance, with mysterious allusions, which, however, did not betray his real suspicions. During the afternoon of Wednesday, 30th October, the Rangoon entered the Strait of Malacca, which separates the peninsula of that name from Sumatra. The mountainous and craggy islets intercepted the beauties of this noble island from the view of the travellers. The Rangoon weighed anchor at Singapore the next day at 4 a.m. to receive coal, having gained half a day on the prescribed time of her arrival. Phileas Fogg noted this gain in his journal, and then, accompanied by Aouda, who betrayed a desire for a walk on shore, disembarked. Fix, who suspected Mr. Fogg's every movement, followed them cautiously, without being himself perceived, while Passepartout, laughing in his sleeve at Fix's maneuvers, went about his usual errands. The island of Singapore is not imposing in aspect, for there are no mountains, yet its appearance is not without attractions. It is a park checkered by pleasant highways and avenues, a handsome carriage drawn by a sleek pair of New Holland horses carried Phileas Fogg and Aouda into the midst of rows of palms with brilliant foliage and of clove trees, whereof the cloves form the heart of a half-open flower. Pepper plants replaced the prickly hedges of European fields. Sago bushes, large ferns with gorgeous branches varied the aspect of this tropical clime, while nutmeg trees in full foliage filled the air with a penetrating perfume. Agile and grinning bands of monkeys skipped about in the trees, nor were tigers wanting in the jungles. After a drive of two hours through the country, Aouda and Mr. Fogg returned to the town, which is a vast collection of heavy-looking, irregular houses surrounded by charming gardens, rich in tropical fruits and plants, and at ten o'clock they re-embarked, closely followed by the detective who had kept them constantly in sight. Passepartout, who had been purchasing several dozen mangoes, a fruit as large as good-sized apples, of a dark brown color outside and a bright red within, and whose white pulp melting in the mouth affords gourmands a delicious sensation, was waiting for them on deck. 
He was only too glad to offer some mangoes to Aouda, who thanked him very gracefully for them. At eleven o'clock the Rangoon rode out of Singapore Harbor, and in a few hours the high mountains of Malacca, with their forests inhabited by the most beautifully furred tigers in the world, were lost to view. Singapore is distant some thirteen hundred miles from the island of Hong Kong, which is a little English colony near the Chinese coast, Phileas Fogg hoped to accomplish the journey in six days, so as to be in time for the steamer which would leave on the 6th of November from Yokohama, the principal Japanese port. The Rangoon had a large quota of passengers, many of whom disembarked at Singapore, among them a number of Indians, Ceylonese, Chinamen, Malays, and Portuguese, mostly second-class travelers. The weather, which had hitherto been fine, changed with the last quarter of the moon. The sea rolled heavily, and the wind at intervals rose almost to a storm, but happily blew from the southwest, and thus aided the steamer's progress. The captain, as often as possible, put up his sails, and under the double action of steam and sail, the vessel made rapid progress along the coasts of Annam and Cochin, China. Owing to the defective construction of the Rangoon, however, unusual precautions became necessary in unfavorable weather, but the loss of time which resulted from this cause, while it nearly drove Passepartout out of his senses, did not seem to affect his master in the least. Passepartout blamed the captain, the engineer, and the crew, and consigned all who were connected with the ship to the land where the pepper grows. Perhaps the thought of the gas which was remorselessly burning at his expense in Seville Row had something to do with his hot impatience. "'You are in a great hurry, then,' said Fix to him one day, "'to reach Hong Kong?' "'A very great hurry. Mr. Fogg, I suppose, is anxious to catch the steamer for Yokohama. Terribly anxious. You believe in this journey round the world, then?' "'Absolutely. Don't you, Mr. Fix?' "'I? I don't believe a word of it.' "'You're a sly dog,' said Passepartout, winking at him. This expression rather disturbed Fix, without his knowing why. Had the Frenchman guessed his real purpose, he knew not what to think. But how could Passepartout have discovered that he was a detective? Yet, in speaking as he did, the man evidently meant more than he expressed. Passepartout went still further the next day, he could not hold his tongue. "'Mr. Fix,' said he, in a bantering tone, "'shall we be so unfortunate as to lose you when we get to Hong Kong?' "'Why,' responded Fix, a little embarrassed, "'I don't know, perhaps. "'Ah, if you would only go on with us. "'An agent of the Peninsular Company, you know, can't stop on the way. "'You were only going to Bombay, and here you are in China. "'America is not far off, and from America to Europe is only a step. Fix looked intently at his companion, whose countenance was as serene as possible, and laughed with him. But Passepartout persisted in chafing him, by asking him if he made much of his present occupation. "'Yes and no,' returned Fix. "'There is good and bad luck in such things. But you must understand that I don't travel at my own expense.' "'Oh, I am quite sure of that,' cried Passepartout, laughing heartily. Fix, fairly puzzled, descended to his cabin and gave himself up to his reflections. He was evidently suspected. Somehow or other the Frenchman had found out that he was a detective. But had he told his master? What part was he playing in all this? Was he an accomplice or not? Was the game then up? Fix spent several hours turning these things over in his mind, sometimes thinking that all was lost then persuading himself that Fogg was ignorant of his presence, and then undecided what course it was best to take. Nevertheless, he preserved his coolness of mind, and at last resolved to deal plainly with Passepartout. If he did not find it practicable to arrest Fogg at Hong Kong, and if Fogg made preparations to leave that last foothold of English territory, he, Fix, would tell Passepartout all. Either the servant was the accomplice of his master, and in this case the master knew of his operations, and he should fail, or else the servant knew nothing about the robbery, and then his interest would be to abandon the robber. Such was the situation between Fix and Passepartout. 
Meanwhile, Phileas Fogg moved about above them in the most majestic and unconscious indifference. He was passing methodically in his orbit around the world, regardless of the lesser stars which gravitated around him. Yet there was nearby what the astronomers would call a disturbing star, which might have produced an agitation in this gentleman's heart. But no, the charms of Aouda failed to act to Passepartout's great surprise, and the disturbances, if they existed, would have been more difficult to calculate than those of Uranus, which led to the discovery of Neptune. It was every day an increasing wonder to Passepartout, who read in Aouda's eyes the depths of her gratitude to his master. Phileas Fogg, though brave and gallant, must be, he thought, quite heartless. As to the sentiment which this journey might have awakened in him, there was clearly no trace of such a thing, while poor Passepartout existed in perpetual reveries. One day he was leaning on the railing of the engine-room, and was observing the engine, when a sudden pitch of the steamer threw the screw out of the water. The steam came hissing out of the valves, and this made Passepartout indignant. "'The valves are not sufficiently charged!' he exclaimed. "'We are not going! Oh, these English! If this was an American craft, we should blow up, perhaps, but we should at all events go faster!' End of chapter 17《Chapter Eighteen of Around the World in Eighty Days》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Around the World in Eighty Days》by Jules Verne, translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter Eighteen, in which Phileas Fogg, Passepartout, and Fix go each about his business. The weather was bad during the latter days of the voyage. The wind, obstinately remaining in the northwest, blew a gale and retarded the steamer. The Rangoon rolled heavily, and the passengers became impatient of the long, monstrous waves which the wind raised before their path. A sort of tempest arose on the 3rd of November, the squall knocking the vessel about with fury, and the waves running high. The Rangoon reefed all her sails, and even the rigging proved too much, whistling and shaking amid the squall. The steamer was forced to proceed slowly, and the captain estimated that she would reach Hong Kong twenty hours behind time, and more if the storm lasted. Phileas Fogg gazed at the tempestuous sea, which seemed to be struggling especially to delay him with his habitual tranquillity. He never changed countenance for an instant, though a delay of twenty hours by making him too late for the Yokohama boat would almost inevitably cause the loss of the wager but this man of nerve manifested neither impatience nor annoyance. It seemed as if the storm were a part of his program, and had been foreseen. Aouda was amazed to find him as calm as he had been from the first time she saw him. Fix did not look at the state of things in the same light. The storm greatly pleased him. His satisfaction would have been complete had the Rangoon been forced to retreat before the violence of wind and waves. Each delay filled him with hope, for it became more and more probable that Fogg would be obliged to remain some days at Hong Kong, and now the heavens themselves became his allies with the gusts and squalls. It mattered not that they made him seasick. He made no account of this inconvenience, and whilst his body was writhing under their effects, his spirit bounded with hopeful exultation. Passepartout was enraged beyond expression by the unpropitious weather. Everything had gone so well till now. Earth and sea had seemed to be at his master's service. Steamers and railways obeyed him. Wind and steam united to speed his journey. Had the hour of adversity come? Passepartout was as much excited as if the twenty thousand pounds were to come from his own pocket. The storm exasperated him. The gale made him furious, and he longed to lash the obstinate sea into obedience. Poor fellow! Fix carefully concealed from him his own satisfaction, for had he betrayed it, Passepartout could scarcely have restrained himself from personal violence. Passepartout remained on deck as long as the tempest lasted, being unable to remain quiet below, and taking it into his head to aid the progress of the ship by lending a hand with the crew. 
He overwhelmed the captain, officers, and sailors who could not help laughing at his impatience with all sorts of questions. He wanted to know exactly how long the storm was going to last, whereupon he was referred to the barometer, which seemed to have no intention of rising. Passepartout shook it, but with no perceptible effect, for neither shaking nor maledictions could prevail upon it to change its mind. On the fourth, however, the sea became more calm, and the storm lessened its violence. The wind veered southward and was once more favorable. Passepartout cleared up with the weather. Some of the sails were unfurled, and the Rangoon resumed its most rapid speed. The time lost could not, however, be regained. Land was not signaled until five o'clock on the morning of the sixth. The steamer was due on the fifth. Phileas Fogg was twenty-four hours behind hand, and the Yokohama steamer would, of course, be missed. The pilot went on board at six and took his place on the bridge to guide the Rangoon through the channels to the port of Hong Kong. Passepartout longed to ask him if the steamer had left for Yokohama, but he dared not, for he wished to preserve the spark of hope which still remained till the last moment. He had confided his anxiety to Fix, who, the sly rascal, tried to console him by saying that Mr. Fogg would be in time if he took the next boat, but this only put Passepartout in a passion. Mr. Fogg, bolder than his servant, did not hesitate to approach the pilot and tranquilly asked him if he knew when a steamer would leave Hong Kong for Yokohama. "'At high tide tomorrow morning,' answered the pilot. "'Ah,' said Mr. Fogg, without betraying any astonishment. Passepartout, who heard what passed, would willingly have embraced the pilot, while Fix would have been glad to twist his neck. "'What is the steamer's name?' asked Mr. Fogg. "'The Carnatic. Ought she not to have gone yesterday?' "'Yes, sir, but they had to repair one of her boilers, and so her departure was postponed till tomorrow.' "'Thank you,' returned Mr. Fogg, descending mathematically to the saloon. Passepartout clasped the pilot's hand and shook it heartily in his delight, exclaiming, "'Pilot, you are the best of good fellows!' The pilot probably does not know to this day why his responses won him this enthusiastic greeting. He remounted the bridge and guided the steamer through the flotilla of junks, tankas, and fishing boats which crowd the harbor of Hong Kong. At one o'clock the Rangoon was at the quay, and the passengers were going ashore. Chance had strangely favored Phileas Fogg, for had not the Carnatic been forced to lie over for repairing her boilers, she would have left on the 6th of November, and the passengers for Japan would have been obliged to await for a week the sailing of the next steamer. Mr. Fogg was, it is true, twenty-four hours behind his time, but this could not seriously imperil the remainder of his tour. The steamer which crossed the Pacific from Yokohama to San Francisco made a direct connection with that from Hong Kong, and it could not sail until the latter reached Yokohama, and if Mr. Fogg was twenty-four hours late on reaching Yokohama, this time would no doubt be easily regained in the voyage of twenty-two days across the Pacific. He found himself then about twenty-four hours behindhand, thirty-five days after leaving London. The Carnatic was announced to leave Hong Kong at five the next morning. Mr. Fogg had sixteen hours in which to attend to his business there, which was to deposit Aouda safely with her wealthy relative. On landing he conducted her to a palaquin, in which they repaired to the club hotel. A room was engaged for the young woman, and Mr. Fogg, after seeing that she wanted for nothing, set out in search of her cousin Gigi. He instructed Passepartout to remain at the hotel until his return that Aouda might not be left entirely alone. Mr. Fogg repaired to the exchange, where, he did not doubt, everyone would know so wealthy and considerable a personage as the Parsee merchant. Meeting a broker, he made the inquiry, to learn that Gigi had left China two years before, and retiring from business with an immense fortune had taken up his residence in Europe. In Holland, the broker thought, with the merchants of which country he had principally traded. Phileas Fogg returned to the hotel, begged a moment's conversation with Aouda, and without more ado apprised her that Gigi was no longer at Hong Kong, 
but probably in Holland. Aouda at first said nothing. She passed her hand across her forehead and reflected a few moments. Then, in her sweet, soft voice, she said, "'What ought I to do, Mr. Fogg?' "'It is very simple,' responded the gentleman. "'Go on to Europe.' "'But I cannot intrude.' "'You do not intrude, nor do you in the least embarrass my project. Passepartout, monsieur, go to the Carnatic and engage three cabins.' Passepartout, delighted that the young woman who was very gracious to him was going to continue the journey with them, went off at a brisk gait to obey his master's order. End of chapter 18「nineteen of around the world in eighty days this librivox recording is in the public domain around the world in eighty days by jules verne translated by george makepeace towel chapter nineteen in which passepartout takes a too great interest in his master and what comes of it Hong Kong is an island which came into the possession of the English by the Treaty of Nanking after the War of 1842, and the colonizing genius of the English has created upon it an important city and an excellent port. The island is situated at the mouth of the Canton River, and is separated by about sixty miles from the Portuguese town of Macao on the opposite coast. Hong Kong has beaten Macao in the struggle for the Chinese trade, and now the greater part of the transportation of Chinese goods finds its depot at the former place. Docks, hospitals, wharves, a Gothic cathedral, a government house, macadamized streets give to Hong Kong the appearance of a town in Kent or Surrey, transferred by some strange magic to the Antipodes. Passepartout wandered with his hands in his pockets towards the Victoria port, gazing as he went at the curious palanquins and other modes of conveyance and the groups of chinese japanese and europeans who passed to and fro in the streets hong kong seemed to him not unlike bombay calcutta and singapore since like them it betrayed everywhere the evidence of english supremacy at the victoria port he found a confused mass of ships of all nations english french american and dutch men of war and trading vessels Japanese and Chinese junks, sempas, tankas, and flower-boats, which form so many floating parteries. Passepartout noticed in the crowd a number of the natives who seemed very old and were dressed in yellow. On going into a barber's to get shaved, he learned that these ancient men were all at least eighty years old, at which age they are permitted to wear yellow, which is the imperial color. Passepartout, without exactly knowing why, thought this very funny. On reaching the quay where they were to embark on the Carnatic, he was not astonished to find Fix walking up and down. The detective seemed very much disturbed and disappointed. "'This is bad,' muttered Passepartout, "'for the gentlemen of the Reform Club.' He accosted Fix with a merry smile, as if he had not perceived that gentleman's chagrin." The detective had indeed good reasons to inveigh against the bad luck which pursued him. The warrant had not come. It was certainly on the way, but as certainly it could not now reach Hong Kong for several days, and this being the last English territory on Mr. Fogg's route, the robber would escape unless he could manage to detain him. "'Well, Monsieur Fix,' said Passepartout, "'have you decided to go with us so far as America?' yes returned fix through his set teeth good exclaimed passepartout laughing heartily i knew you could not persuade yourself to separate from us come and engage your berth they entered the steamer office and secured cabins for four persons the clerk as he gave them the tickets informed them that the repairs on the carnatic having been completed the steamer would leave that very evening and not next morning as had been announced that will suit my master all the better, said Passepartout. I will go and let him know. Fix now decided to make a bold move. He resolved to tell Passepartout all. It seemed to be the only possible means of keeping Phileas Fogg several days longer at Hong Kong. He accordingly invited his companion into a tavern which caught his eye on the quay. 
On entering they found themselves in a large room handsomely decorated, at the end of which was a large camp bed furnished with cushions. Several persons lay upon this bed in a deep sleep. At the small tables which were arranged about the room some thirty customers were drinking English beer, porter, gin, and brandy, smoking the while long red clay pipes stuffed with little balls of opium mingled with essence of rose. From time to time one of the smokers, overcome with the narcotic, would slip under the table, whereupon the waiters, taking him by the head and feet, carried and laid him upon the bed. The bed already supported twenty of these stupefied sots. Fix and Passepartout saw that they were in a smoking-house haunted by those wretched, cadaverous, idiotic creatures to whom the English merchants sell every year the miserable drug called opium, to the amount of one million four hundred thousand pounds, thousands devoted to one of the most despicable vices which afflict humanity. The Chinese government has in vain attempted to deal with the evil by stringent laws. It passed gradually from the rich, to whom it was at first exclusively reserved, to the lower classes, and then its ravages could not be arrested. Opium is smoked everywhere at all times by men and women in the celestial empire, and once accustomed to it the victims cannot dispense with it, except by suffering horrible bodily contortions and agonies. A great smoker can smoke as many as eight pipes a day, but he dies in five years. It was in one of these dens that Fix and Passepartout, in search of a friendly glass, found themselves. Passepartout had no money, but willingly accepted Fix's invitation in the hope of returning the obligation at some future time. They ordered two bottles of port, to which the Frenchman did ample justice, whilst Fix observed him with close attention. They chatted about the journey, and Passepartout was especially merry at the idea that Fix was going to continue it with them. When the bottles were empty, however, he rose to go and tell his master of the change in the time of the sailing of the Carnatic. Fix caught him by the arm and said, "'Wait a moment. What for, Mr. Fix? I want to have a serious talk with you.' "'A serious talk?' cried Passepartout, drinking up the little wine that was left in the bottom of his glass. "'Well, we'll talk about it to-morrow. I haven't time now. Stay. What I have to say concerns your master.' Passepartout at this looked attentively at his companion. Fix's face seemed to have a singular expression. He resumed his seat. "'What is it that you have to say?' Fix placed his hand upon Passepartout's arm, and, lowering his voice, said, "'You have guessed who I am?' "'Parbleu!' said Passepartout, smiling. "'Then I'm going to tell you everything.' "'Now that I know everything, my friend, ah, oh, that's very good. But go on, go on. First, though, let me tell you that those gentlemen have put themselves to a useless expense.' "'Useless?' said Fix. "'You speak confidently. It's clear that you don't know how large the sum is.' "'Of course I do,' returned Passepartout. Twenty thousand pounds.' Fifty-five thousand answered Fix, pressing his companion's hand. "'What?' cried the Frenchman. "'Has Monsieur Fogg dared fifty-five thousand pounds? Well, there's all the more reason for not losing an instant.' He continued getting up hastily. Fix pushed Passepartout back in his chair, and resumed. Fifty-five thousand pounds, and if I succeed I get two thousand pounds. If you'll help me I'll let you have five hundred of them. "'Help you?' cried Passepartout, whose eyes were standing wide open. "'Yes, help me keep Mr. Fogg here for two or three days. "'Why, what are you saying? "'Those gentlemen are not satisfied with following my master and suspecting his honor, "'but they must try to put obstacles in his way. "'I blush for them.' "'What do you mean?' "'I mean that it is a piece of shameful trickery. "'They might as well waylay Mr. Fogg and put his money in their pockets. "'That's just what we count on doing.' "'It's a conspiracy, then!' cried Passepartout, who became more and more excited as the liquor mounted in his head, for he drank without perceiving it. "'A real conspiracy! And gentlemen, too! Bah!' Fix began to be puzzled. "'Members of the Reform Club!' continued Passepartout. "'You must know, Monsieur Fix, that my master is an honest man, and that when he makes a wager he tries to win it fairly.' 
"'But who do you think I am?' asked Fix, looking at him intently. "'Parbleu! An agent of the members of the Reform Club sent out here to interrupt my master's journey. But though I found you out some time ago, I've taken good care to say nothing about it to Mr. Fogg. "'He knows nothing, then?' "'Nothing,' replied Passepartout, again emptying his glass. The detective passed his hand across his forehead, hesitating before he spoke again. What should he do? Passepartout's mistake seemed sincere, but it made his design more difficult. It was evident that the servant was not the master's accomplice, as Fix had been inclined to suspect. Well, said the detective to himself, as he is not an accomplice, he will help me. He had no time to lose. Fogg must be detained at Hong Kong, so he resolved to make a clean breast of it. Listen to me, said Fix abruptly. I am not, as you think, an agent of the members of the Reform Club. Bah, retorted Passepartout with an air of raillery. I am a police detective sent out here by the London office. You a detective? I will prove it. Here is my commission. Passepartout was speechless with astonishment when Fix displayed this document, the genuineness of which could not be doubted. Mr. Fogg's wager, resumed Fix, is only a pretext of which you and the gentlemen of the reform are dupes. He had a motive for securing your innocent complicity. But why? Listen. On the 28th of last September a robbery of fifty-five thousand pounds was committed at the Bank of England by a person whose description was fortunately secured. Here is his description. It answers exactly to that of Mr. Phileas Fogg. What nonsense! cried Passepartout, striking the table with his fist. My master is the most honorable of men. How can you tell? You know scarcely anything about him. You went into his service the day he came away, and he came away on a foolish pretext, without trunks and carrying a large amount in banknotes, and yet you are bold enough to assert that he is an honest man. Yes, yes, repeated the poor fellow mechanically. "'Would you like to be arrested as his accomplice?' Passepartout, overcome by what he had heard, held his head between his hands, and did not dare to look at the detective. Phileas Fogg, the savior of Aouda, that brave and generous man, a robber? And yet how many presumptions there were against him! Passepartout essayed to reject the suspicions which forced themselves upon his mind. He did not wish to believe that his master was guilty. "'Well, what do you want of me?' said he, at last, with an effort. "'See here,' replied Fix, "'I have tracked Mr. Fogg to this place, but as yet I have failed to receive the warrant of arrest for which I sent to London. You must help me to keep him here in Hong Kong.' "'I—' uh, "'But I—' "'I will share with you the two thousand pounds reward offered by the Bank of England.' "'Never!' replied Passepartout, who tried to rise, but fell back exhausted in mind and body. "'Mr. Fitz,' he stammered, "'even should what you say be true, if my master is really the robber you are seeking for, which I deny, I have been, am, in his service. I have seen his generosity and goodness, and I will never betray him, not for all the gold in the world. I come from a village where they don't eat that kind of bread.' "'You refuse?' I refuse. Consider that I've said nothing, said Fix, and let us drink. Yes, let us drink. Passepartout felt himself yielding more and more to the effects of the liquor. Fix, seeing that he must, at all hazards, be separated from his master, wished to entirely overcome him. Some pipes full of opium lay upon the table. Fix slipped one into Passepartout's hand. He took it put it between his lips, lit it, drew several puffs, and his head, becoming heavy under the influence of the narcotic, fell upon the table. "'At last,' said Fix, seeing Passepartout unconscious, "'Mr. Fogg will not be informed of the Carnatic's departure, and if he is he will have to go without this cursed Frenchman.' And after paying his bill, Fix left the tavern. End of chapter 19
twenty of Around the World in Eighty Days. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter Twenty in which Fix comes face to face with Phileas Fogg. While these events were passing at the opium house, Mr. Fogg, unconscious of the danger he was in of losing the steamer, was quietly escorting Aouda about the streets of the English quarter, making the necessary purchases for the long voyage before them. It was all very well for an Englishman like Mr. Fogg to make the tour of the world with a carpet-bag, a lady could not be expected to travel comfortably under such conditions. He acquitted his task with characteristic serenity, and invariably replied to the remonstrances of his fair companion, who was confused by his patience and generosity. It is in the interest of my journey, a part of my program. The purchases made, they returned to the hotel, where they dined at a sumptuously served table d'hote, after which Aouda, shaking hands with her protector, after the English fashion, retired to her room for rest. Mr. Fogg absorbed himself throughout the evening in the perusal of the Times and illustrated London news. Had he been capable of being astonished at anything, it would have been not to see his servant return at bedtime. But knowing that the steamer was not to leave for Yokohama until the next morning, he did not disturb himself about the matter. When Passepartout did not appear the next morning to answer his master's bell, Mr. Fogg, not betraying the least vexation, contented himself with taking his carpet-bag, calling Aouda and sending for a palanquin. It was then eight o'clock. At half-past nine, it being then high tide, the Carnatic would leave the harbor. Mr. Fogg and Aouda got into the palanquin, their luggage being brought after on a wheelbarrow and half an hour later stepped upon the quay whence they were to embark. Mr. Fogg then learned that the Carnatic had sailed the evening before. He had expected to find not only the steamer, but his domestic, and was forced to give up both. But no sign of disappointment appeared on his face, and he merely remarked to Aouda, "'It is an accident, madam, nothing more.' At this moment a man who had been observing him attentively approached. It was Fix who, bowing, addressed Mr. Fogg. "'Were you not, like me, sir, a passenger by the Rangoon which arrived yesterday?' "'I was, sir,' replied Mr. Fogg coldly. "'But I have not the honor. Pardon me, I thought I should find your servant here.' "'Do you know where he is, sir?' asked Aouda anxiously. "'What?' responded Fix, feigning surprise. "'Is he not with you?' "'No,' said Aouda. "'He has not made his appearance since yesterday.' "'Could he have gone on board the Carnatic without us?' "'Without you, madam,' answered the detective. "'Excuse me, did you intend to sail in the Carnatic?' "'Yes, sir.' "'So did I, madam, and I am excessively disappointed. The Carnatic, its repairs being completed, left Hong Kong twelve hours before the stated time, without any notice being given, and we must now wait a week for another steamer.' As he said a week, Fix felt his heart leap for joy. Fogg detained at Hong Kong for a week. There would be time for the warrant to arrive, and fortune at last favored the representative of the law. His horror may be imagined when he heard Mr. Fogg say in his placid voice, but there are other vessels besides the Carnatic, it seems to me, in the harbor of Hong Kong. And offering his arm to Aouda, he directed his steps toward the docks in search of some craft about to start. Fix, stupefied, followed. It seemed as if he were attached to Mr. Fogg by an invisible thread. Chance, however, appeared really to have abandoned the man it had hitherto served so well. For three hours Phileas Fogg wandered about the docks, with the determination, if necessary, to charter a vessel to carry him to Yokohama. But he could only find vessels which were loading or unloading, and which could not, therefore, set sail. Fix began to hope again. But Mr. Fogg, far from being discouraged, was continuing his search, resolved not to stop if he had to resort to Mikhail, when he was accosted by a sailor on one of the wharves. "'Is your honor looking for a boat?' "'Have you a boat ready to sail?' 
Yes, your honor, a pilot boat, number 43, the best in the harbor. Does she go fast? Between eight and nine knots the hour. Will you look at her? Yes. Your honor will be satisfied with her. Is it for a sea excursion? No, for a voyage. A voyage? Yes. Will you agree to take me to Yokohama? The sailor leaned on the railing, opened his eyes wide, and said, Is your honor joking? No, I have missed the Carnatic, and I must get to Yokohama by the fourteenth at the latest to take the boat for San Francisco. I am sorry, said the sailor, but it is impossible. I offer you a hundred pounds per day, and an additional reward of two hundred pounds if I reach Yokohama in time. Are you in earnest? Very much so. The pilot walked away a little distance and gazed out to sea, evidently struggling between the anxiety to gain a large sum and the fear of venturing so far. Fix was in mortal suspense. Mr. Fogg turned to Aouda and asked her, "'You would not be afraid, would you, madam?' "'Not with you, Mr. Fogg,' was her answer. The pilot now returned, shuffling his hat in his hands. "'Well, pilot,' said Mr. Fogg. "'Well, your honor,' replied he, "'I could not risk myself, my men, or my little boat of scarcely twenty tons on so long a voyage at this time of year. Besides, we could not reach Yokohama in time, for it is sixteen hundred and sixty miles from Hong Kong.' "'Only sixteen hundred, said Mr. Fogg. "'It's the same thing.' Fix breathed more freely. "'But,' added the pilot, "'it might be arranged another way.' Fix ceased to breathe at all. "'How?' asked Mr. Fogg. "'By going to Nagasaki at the extreme south of Japan, or even to Shanghai, which is only eight hundred miles from here. In going to Shanghai we should not be forced to sail wide of the Chinese coast, which would be a great advantage, as the currents run northward and would aid us.' "'Pilot,' said Mr. Fogg, I must take the American steamer at Yokohama, and not at Shanghai or Nagasaki. Why not? returned the pilot. The San Francisco steamer does not start from Yokohama. It puts in at Yokohama and Nagasaki, but it starts from Shanghai. You are sure of that? Perfectly. And when does the boat leave Shanghai? On the eleventh at seven in the evening. We have, therefore, four days before us, that is ninety-six hours, and in that time, if we had good luck and a southwest wind and the sea was calm, we could make those eight hundred miles to Shanghai. And you could go? In an hour, as soon as provisions could be got aboard and the sails put up. It is a bargain. Are you the master of the boat? Yes, John Bunsby, master of the Tankadier. Would you like some earnest money? if it would not put your honor out. Here are two hundred pounds on account, sir, added Phileas Fogg, turning to Fix. If you would like to take advantage. Thanks, sir. I was about to ask the favor. Very well. In half an hour we shall go on board. But poor Passepartout, urged Aouda, who was much disturbed by the servant's disappearance. I shall do all I can to find him, replied Phileas Fogg. While Fix, in a feverish, nervous state, repaired to the pilot boat, the others directed their course to the police station at Hong Kong. Phileas Fogg there gave Passepartout's description, and left a sum of money to be spent in the search for him. The same formalities having been gone through at the French consulate, and the palanquin having stopped at the hotel for the luggage, which had been sent back there, they returned to the wharf. It was now three o'clock and pilot boat number 43, with its crew on board and its provisions stored away, was ready for departure. The Tankadier was a neat little craft of twenty tons, as gracefully built as if she were a racing yacht. Her shining copper sheathing, her galvanized ironwork, her deck, white as ivory, betrayed the pride taken by John Bunsby in making her presentable. Her two masts leaned a trifle backward, she carried brigantine, foresail, storm-jib, and standing-jib, and was well rigged for running before the wind, 
and she seemed capable of brisk speed, which indeed she had already proved by gaining several prizes in pilot-boat races. The crew of the Tankadier was composed of John Bunsby, the master, and four hardy mariners who were familiar with the Chinese seas. John Bunsby himself, a man of forty-five or thereabouts, vigorous, sunburnt, with a sprightly expression of the eye, and energetic and self-reliant countenance, would have inspired confidence in the most timid. Phileas Fogg and Aouda went on board, where they found Fix already installed. Below deck was a square cabin of which the walls bulged out in the form of cots, above a circular divan. In the center was a table provided with a swinging lamp. The accommodation was confined but neat. "'I am sorry to have nothing better to offer you,' said Mr. Fogg to Fix, who bowed without responding. The detective had a feeling akin to humiliation in profiting by the kindness of Mr. Fogg. "'It's certain,' thought he, "'though a rascal as he is, he is a polite one.' The sails and the English flag were hoisted at ten minutes past three. Mr. Fogg and Aouda, who were seated on deck, cast a last glance at the quay in the hope of espying Passepartout. Fix was not without his fears, lest chance should direct the steps of the unfortunate servant, whom he had so badly treated, in this direction, in which case an explanation, the reverse of satisfactory to the detective, must have ensued. But the Frenchman did not appear, and without doubt was still lying under the stupefying influence of the opium. John Bunsby, master, at length gave the order to start, and the tankadier, taking the wind under her brigantine, foresail, and standing jib, bounded briskly forward over the waves. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 of Around the World in Eighty Days – this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne Translated by George Makepeace Towell Chapter 21 In Which the Master of the Tankadier Runs Great Risk of Losing a Reward of Two Hundred Pounds This voyage of eight hundred miles was a perilous venture on a craft of twenty tons, and at that season of the year... The Chinese seas were usually boisterous, subject to terrible gales of wind, and especially during the equinoxes, and it was now early November. It would clearly have been to the master's advantage to carry his passengers to Yokohama, since he was paid a certain sum per day, but he would have been rash to attempt such a voyage, and it was imprudent even to attempt to reach Shanghai. But John Bunsby believed in the tankadier, which rode on the waves like a seagull and perhaps he was not wrong. Late in the day they passed through the capricious channels of Hong Kong, and the tankadier, impelled by favorable winds, conducted herself admirably. "'I do not need, pilot,' said Phileas Fogg, when they got into the open sea, "'to advise you to use all possible speed. "'Trust me, Your Honor, we are carrying all the sail the wind will let us. "'The poles would add nothing.' and are only used when we are going into port. It's your trade, not mine, pilot, and I confide in you. Phileas Fogg, with body erect and legs wide apart, standing like a sailor, gazed without staggering at the swelling waters. The young woman who was seated aft was profoundly affected as she looked out upon the ocean, darkening now with the twilight, on which she had ventured in so frail a vessel. Above her head rustled the white sails, which seemed like great white wings. The boat, carried forward by the wind, seemed to be flying in the air. Night came. The moon was entering her first quarter, and her insufficient light would soon die out in the mist on the horizon. Clouds were rising from the east, and already overcast a part of the heavens. The pilot had hung out his lights, which was very necessary in these seas crowded with vessels bound landward, for collisions are not uncommon occurrences, and at the speed she was going the least shock would shatter the gallant little craft. Fix, seated in the bow, gave himself up to meditation. 
he kept apart from his fellow travelers, knowing Mr. Fogg's taciturn tastes. Besides, he did not quite like to talk to the man whose favors he had accepted. He was thinking, too, of the future. It seemed certain that Fogg would not stop at Yokohama, but would at once take the boat for San Francisco, and the vast extent of America would ensure him impunity and safety. Fogg's plan appeared to him the simplest in the world. Instead of sailing directly from England to the United States like a common villain, he had traversed three-quarters of the globe so as to gain the American continent more surely, and there, after throwing the police off his track, he would quietly enjoy himself with the fortune stolen from the bank. But once in the United States, what should he fix do? Should he abandon this man? No, a hundred times no. Until he had secured his extradition, he would not lose sight of him for an hour. It was his duty, and he would fulfill it to the end. At all events, there was one thing to be thankful for. Passepartout was not with his master, and it was above all important, after the confidences Fix had imparted to him, that the servant should never have speech with his master. Phileas Fogg was also thinking of Passepartout, who had so strangely disappeared. Looking at the matter from every point of view, it did not seem to him impossible that by some mistake the man might have embarked on the Carnatic at the last moment, and this was also Aouda's opinion, who regretted very much the loss of the worthy fellow to whom she owed so much. They might then find him at Yokohama, for if the Carnatic was carrying him thither it would be easy to ascertain if he had been on board. A brisk breeze arose about ten o'clock, but though it might have been prudent to take in a reef, the pilot, after carefully examining the heavens, let the craft remain rigged as before. The tankadier bore sail admirably, as she drew a great deal of water, and everything was prepared for high speed in case of a gale. Mr. Fogg and Aouda descended into the cabin at midnight, having been already preceded by Fix who had lain down on one of the cots. The pilot and crew remained on deck all night. At sunrise the next day, which was the 8th of November, the boat had made more than one hundred miles. The log indicated a mean speed of between eight and nine miles. The tankadier still carried all sail, and was accomplishing her greatest capacity of speed. If the wind held as it was, the chances would be in her favor. During the day she kept along the coast, where the currents were favorable. The coast, irregular in profile and visible sometimes across the clearings, was at most five miles distant. The sea was less boisterous, since the wind came off land, a fortunate circumstance for the boat, which would suffer, owing to its small tonnage, by a heavy surge on the sea. The breeze subsided a little towards noon, and set in from the southwest. The pilot put up his poles, but took them down again within two hours, as the wind freshened up anew. Mr. Fogg and Aouda, happily unaffected by the roughness of the sea, ate with a good appetite, Fix being invited to share their repast, which he accepted with secret chagrin. To travel at this man's expense and live upon his provisions was not palatable to him. Still, he was obliged to eat, and so he ate. When the meal was over, he took Mr. Fogg apart and said, Sir, this sir scorched his lips, and he had to control himself to avoid collaring this gentleman. Sir, you have been very kind to give me a passage on this boat, but though my means will not admit of my expending them as freely as you, I must ask to pay my share. Let us not speak of that, sir, replied Mr. Fogg. But if I insist? No, sir repeated Mr. Fogg, in a tone which did not admit of a reply. This enters into my general expenses. Fix, as he bowed, had a stifled feeling, and going forward, where he ensconced himself, did not open his mouth for the rest of the day. Meanwhile they were progressing famously, and John Bunsby was in high hope. He several times assured Mr. Fogg that they would reach Shanghai in time, to which that gentleman responded that he counted upon it. The crew set to work in good earnest, inspired by the reward to be gained. There was not a sheet which was not tightened, not a sail which was not vigorously hoisted, 
Not a lurch could be charged to the man at the helm. They worked as desperately as if they were contesting in a royal yacht regatta. By evening the log showed that two hundred and twenty miles had been accomplished from Hong Kong, and Mr. Fogg might hope that he would be able to reach Yokohama without recording any delay in his journal, in which case the many misadventures which had overtaken him since he left London would not seriously affect his journey. The Tankadir entered the Straits of Fokien, which separate the island of Formosa from the Chinese coast in the small hours of the night, and crossed the Tropic of Cancer. The sea was very rough in the straits, full of eddies formed by the counter-currents, and the chopping waves broke her course, whilst it became very difficult to stand on deck. At daybreak the wind began to blow hard again, and the heavens seemed to predict a gale. The barometer announced a speedy change, the mercury rising and falling capriciously. The sea also in the southeast raised long surges, which indicated a tempest. The sun had set the evening before in a red mist, in the midst of the phosphorescent scintillations of the ocean. John Bunsby long examined the threatening aspect of the heavens, muttering indistinctly between his teeth. At last he said in a low voice to Mr. Fogg, "'Shall I speak out to your honor? "'Of course. "'Well, we are going to have a squall.' "'Is the wind north or south?' asked Mr. Fogg quietly. "'South. Look, a typhoon is coming up. "'Glad it's a typhoon from the south, for it will carry us forward.' "'Oh, if you take it that way,' said John Bunsby, "'I've nothing more to say.' John Bunsby's suspicions were confirmed. At a less advanced season of the year the typhoon, according to a famous meteorologist, would have passed away like a luminous cascade of electric flame but in the winter equinox it was to be feared that it would burst upon them with great violence. The pilot took his precautions in advance. He reefed all sail. The pole masts were dispensed with. All hands went forward to the bows. A single triangular sail of strong canvas was hoisted as a storm jib so as to hold the wind from behind. Then they waited. John Bunsby had requested his passengers to go below but this imprisonment in so narrow a space with little air and the boat bouncing in the gale was far from pleasant neither mr fogg fix nor aouda consented to leave the deck the storm of rain and wind descended upon them towards eight o'clock but with its bit of sail the tankadier was lifted like a feather by a wind an idea of whose violence can scarcely be given to compare her speed to four times that of a locomotive going on full steam would be below the truth. The boat scudded thus northward during the whole day, borne on by monstrous waves, preserving always, fortunately, a speed equal to theirs. Twenty times she seemed almost to be submerged by these mountains of water which rose behind her, but the adroit management of the pilot saved her. The passengers were often bathed in spray, but they submitted to it philosophically. Fix cursed it, no doubt, but Aouda, with her eyes fastened upon her protector, whose coolness amazed her, showed herself worthy of him, and bravely weathered the storm. As for Phileas Fogg, it seemed just as if the typhoon were a part of his program. Up to this time the tankadier had always held her course to the north, but towards evening the wind, veering three-quarters, bore down from the northwest. The boat, now lying in the trough of the waves, shook and rolled terribly. The sea struck her with fearful violence. At night the tempest increased in violence. John Bunsby saw the approach of darkness and the rising of the storm with dark misgivings. He thought a while, and then asked his crew if it was not time to slacken speed. After a consultation he approached Mr. Fogg and said, I think, Your Honor, that we should do well to make for one of the ports on the coast. I think so, too. Ah, said the pilot, but which one? I know of but one, returned Mr. Fogg tranquilly, and that is Shanghai. The pilot at first did not seem to comprehend. He could scarcely realize so much determination and tenacity. Then he cried, Well, yes, Your Honor is right to Shanghai. 
so the tankadier kept steadily on her northward track. The night was really terrible. It would be a miracle if the craft did not founder. Twice it could have been all over with her if the crew had not been constantly on the watch. Aouda was exhausted, but did not utter a complaint. More than once Mr. Fogg rushed to protect her from the violence of the waves. Day reappeared. The tempest still raged with undiminished fury, but the wind now returned to the southeast. It was a favorable change, and the tankadier again bounded forward on this mountainous sea, though the waves crossed each other and imparted shocks and countershocks which would have crushed a craft less solidly built. From time to time the coast was visible through the broken mist, but no vessel was in sight. The tankadier was alone upon the sea. There were some signs of a calm at noon, and these became more distinct as the sun descended toward the horizon. The tempest had been as brief as terrific. The passengers, thoroughly exhausted, could now eat a little and take some repose. The night was comparatively quiet. Some of the sails were again hoisted, and the speed of the boat was very good. The next morning at dawn they espied the coast, and John Bunsby was able to assert that they were not one hundred miles from Shanghai, a hundred miles, and only one day to traverse them. That very evening Mr. Fogg was due at Shanghai if he did not wish to miss the steamer to Yokohama. Had there been no storm, during which several hours were lost, they would be at this moment within thirty miles of their destination. The wind grew decidedly calmer, and happily the sea fell with it. All sails were now hoisted, and at noon the tankadier was within forty-five miles of Shanghai. There remained yet six hours in which to accomplish that distance. All on board feared that it could not be done, and every one, Phileas Fogg, no doubt excepted, felt his heart beat with impatience. The boat must keep up an average of nine miles an hour, and the wind was becoming calmer every moment. It was a capricious breeze coming from the coast, and after it passed the sea became smooth. Still the tankadier was so light, and her fine sails caught the fickle zephyr so well that with the aid of the currents John Bunsby found himself at six o'clock, not more than ten miles from the mouth of Shanghai River. Shanghai itself is situated at least twelve miles up the stream. At seven they were still three miles from Shanghai. The pilot swore an angry oath. The reward of two hundred pounds was evidently on the point of escaping him. He looked at Mr. Fogg. Mr. Fogg was perfectly tranquil, and yet his whole fortune was at this moment at stake. At this moment also a long black funnel crowned with wreaths of smoke appeared on the edge of the waters. It was the American steamer leaving for Yokohama at the appointed time. "'Confound her!' cried John Bunsby, pushing back the rudder with a desperate jerk. "'Signal her,' said Phileas Fogg quietly. A small brass cannon stood on the forward deck of the tankadier for making signals in the fogs. It was loaded to the muzzle but just as the pilot was about to apply a red-hot coal to the touch-hole, Mr. Fogg said, "'Hoist your flag!' The flag was run up at half-mast, and this being the signal of distress, it was hoped that the American steamer, perceiving it, would change her course a little, so as to succor the pilot boat. "'Fire!' said Mr. Fogg, and the booming of the little cannon resounded in the air. End of chapter 21 Chapter Twenty Two of Around the World in Eighty Days. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne. Translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter Twenty Two In Which Passepartout Finds Out That Even at the Antipodes It Is Convenient to Have Some Money in One's Pocket. The Carnatic, setting sail from Hong Kong at half past six on the seventh of November, directed her course at full steam towards Japan. She carried a large cargo and a well-filled cabin of passengers. Two staterooms in the rear were, however, unoccupied, those which had been engaged by Phileas Fogg. The next day a passenger with a half-stupefied eye, staggering gait and disordered hair, 
was seen to emerge from the second cabin and to totter to a seat on deck. It was Passepartout, and what had happened to him was as follows. Shortly after Fix left the opium den, two waiters had lifted the unconscious Passepartout and had carried him to the bed reserved for the smokers. Three hours later, pursued even in his dreams by a fixed idea, the poor fellow awoke and struggled against the stupefying influence of the narcotic. The thought of a duty unfulfilled shook off his torpor, and he hurried from the abode of drunkenness, staggering and holding himself up by keeping against the walls, falling down and creeping up again, and irresistibly impelled by a kind of instinct, he kept crying out, The Carnatic! The Carnatic! The steamer lay puffing alongside the quay on the point of starting. Passepartout had but few steps to go, and rushing upon the plank he crossed it and fell unconscious on the deck, just as the Carnatic was moving off. Several sailors, who were evidently accustomed to this sort of scene, carried the poor Frenchman down into the second cabin, and Passepartout did not wake until they were one hundred and fifty miles away from China. Thus he found himself the next morning on the deck of the Carnatic, and eagerly inhaling the exhilarating sea breeze. The pure air sobered him. He began to collect his sense, which he found a difficult task, but at last he recalled the events of the evening before. Fix's revelation and the opium house. It is evident, said he to himself, that I have been abominably drunk. What will Mr. Fogg say? At least I have not missed the steamer, which is the most important thing. Then, as Fix occurred to him, as for that rascal, I hope we are well rid of him, and that he has not dared, as he proposed, to follow us on board the Carnatic a detective on the track of Mr. Fogg, accused of robbing the Bank of England. Pshaw! Mr. Fogg is no more a robber than I am a murderer. Should he divulge Fix's real errand to his master? Would it do to tell the part the detective was playing? Would it not be better to wait until Mr. Fogg reached London again, and then impart to him that an agent of the Metropolitan Police had been following him round the world, and have a good laugh over it? No doubt. At least it was worth considering. The first thing to do was to find Mr. Fogg and apologize for his singular behavior. Passepartout got up and proceeded as well as he could with the rolling of the steamer to the after-deck. He saw no one who resembled either his master or Aouda. Good, muttered he. Aouda has not got up yet, and Mr. Fogg has probably found some partners at whist. He descended to the saloon. Mr. Fogg was not there. Passepartout had only, however, to ask the purser the number of his master's stateroom. The purser replied that he did not know any passenger by the name of Fogg. "'I beg your pardon,' said Passepartout persistently. "'He is a tall gentleman, quiet, not very talkative, and has with him a young lady.' "'There is no young lady on board,' interrupted the purser. "'Here is a list of the passengers. You may see for yourself.' Passepartout scanned the list, but his master's name was not upon it. All at once an idea struck him. "'Ah! Oh, am I on the Carnatic?' "'Yes.' "'On the way to Yokohama?' "'Certainly.' Passepartout had for an instant feared that he was on the wrong boat, but though he was really on the Carnatic, his master was not there. He fell thunderstruck on a seat. He saw it all now. He remembered that the time of sailing had been changed, that he should have informed his master of that fact, and that he had not done so. It was his fault, then, that Mr. Fogg and Aouda had missed the steamer. Yes, but it was still more the fault of the traitor who, in order to separate him from his master and detain the latter at Hong Kong, had inveigled him into getting drunk. He now saw the detective's trick, and at this moment Mr. Fogg was certainly ruined. His bet was lost, and he himself perhaps arrested and imprisoned. At this thought Passepartout tore his hair. Ah, oh, if Fix ever came within his reach, what a settling of accounts there would be! After his first depression, Passepartout became calmer, and began to study his situation. It was certainly not an enviable one. He found himself on the way to Japan, and what should he do when he got there? His pocket was empty. He had not a solitary shilling, not so much as a penny. His passage had fortunately been paid for in advance, 
and he had five or six days in which to decide upon his future course. He fell, too, at meals with an appetite, and ate for Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and himself. He helped himself as generously as if Japan were a dessert, where nothing to eat was to be looked for. At dawn on the 13th, the Carnatic entered the port of Yokohama. This is an important port of call in the Pacific, where all the mail steamers and those carrying travelers between North America, China, Japan, and the Oriental Islands put in. It is situated in the Bay of Yeddo, and at but a short distance from that second capital of the Japanese Empire, and the residence of the tycoon, the civil emperor, before the Mikado, the spiritual emperor, absorbed his office in his own. The Carnatic anchored at the quay near the Custom House in the midst of a crowd of ships bearing the flags of all nations. Passepartout went timidly ashore on this so curious territory of the Sons of the Sun. He had nothing better to do than, taking chance for his guide, to wander aimlessly through the streets of Yokohama. He found himself at first in a thoroughly European quarter, the houses having low fronts and being adorned with verandas, beneath which he caught glimpses of neat peristyles. This quarter occupied with its streets, squares, docks, and warehouses all the space between the promontory of the treaty and the river. Here, as at Hong Kong and Calcutta, were mixed crowds of all races, Americans and English, Chinamen and Dutchmen, mostly merchants ready to buy or sell anything. The Frenchman felt himself as much alone among them as if he had dropped down in the midst of Hottentots. He had at least one resource to call on, the French and English consuls at Yokohama for assistance, but he shrank from telling the story of his adventures, intimately connected as it was with that of his master, and before doing so he determined to exhaust all other means of aid. As chance did not favor him in the European quarter, he penetrated that inhabited by the native Japanese, determined, if necessary, to push on to Yeddo. The Japanese quarter of Yokohama is called Benton, after the goddess of the sea, who is worshipped on the islands round about. There Passepartout beheld beautiful fir and cedar groves, sacred gates of a singular architecture, bridges half hid in the midst of bamboos and reeds, temples shaded by immense cedar trees, holy retreats where were sheltered Buddhist priests and sectaries of Confucius, and interminable streets, where a perfect harvest of rose-tinted and red-cheeked children, who looked as if they had been cut out of Japanese screens, and who were playing in the midst of short-legged poodles and yellowish cats, might have been gathered. The streets were crowded with people. Priests were passing in processions, beating their dreary tambourines, Police and custom-house officers with pointed hats encrusted with lac and carrying two sabers hung to their waists, soldiers clad in blue cotton with white stripes and bearing guns, the Mikado's guards enveloped in silken doubles, hauberks and coats of mail, and numbers of military folk of all ranks, for the military profession is as much respected in Japan as it is despised in China, went hither and thither in groups and pairs. Passepartout saw, too, begging friars, long-robed pilgrims, and simple civilians with their warped and jet-black hair, big heads, long butts, slender legs, short stature, and complexions varying from copper color to a dead white, but never yellow like the Chinese, from whom the Japanese widely differ. He did not fail to observe the curious equipages, carriages, and palanquins, barrows supplied with sails and litters made of bamboo, nor the women whom he thought not especially handsome, who took little steps with their little feet, whereon they wore canvas shoes, straw sandals, and clogs of worked wood, and who displayed tight-looking eyes, flat chests, teeth fashionably blackened, and gowns crossed with silken scarves, tied in an enormous knot behind an ornament which the modern Parisian ladies seem to have borrowed from the dames of Japan. Passepartout wandered for several hours in the midst of this motley crowd, looking in at the windows of the rich and curious shops, the jewelry establishments glittering with quaint Japanese ornaments, the restaurants decked with streamers and banners, the tea-houses where the odorous beverage was being drunk with sake, 
a liquor concocted from the fermentation of rice, and the comfortable smoking-houses, where they were puffing not opium, which is almost unknown in Japan, but a very fine stringy tobacco. He went on till he found himself in the fields, in the midst of vast rice plantations. There he saw dazzling camellias expanding themselves, with flowers which were giving forth their last colors and perfumes, not on bushes, but on trees, and within bamboo enclosures cherry plum and apple trees which the japanese cultivate rather for their blossoms than their fruit and which queerly fashioned grinning scarecrows protected from the sparrows pigeons ravens and other voracious birds on the branches of the cedars were perched large eagles amid the foliage of the weeping willows were herons solemnly standing on one leg and on every hand were crows, ducks, hawks, wild birds, and a multitude of cranes, which the Japanese consider sacred, and which to their minds symbolize long life and prosperity. As he was strolling along, Passepartout espied some violets among the shrubs. Good, said he, I'll have some supper. But on smelling them he found that they were odorless. No chance there, thought he. The worthy fellow had certainly taken good care to eat as hearty a breakfast as possible before leaving the Carnatic, but as he had been walking about all day the demands of hunger were becoming importunate. He observed that the butcher's stalls contained neither mutton, goat, nor pork, and knowing also that it is a sacrilege to kill cattle which are preserved solely for farming, he made up his mind that meat was far from plentiful in Yokohama, nor was he mistaken and in default of butcher's meat he could have wished for a quarter of wild boar or deer, a partridge, or some quails, some game or fish, which, with rice, the Japanese eat almost exclusively. But he found it necessary to keep up a stout heart, and to postpone the meal he craved till the following morning. Night came, and Passepartout re-entered the native quarter, where he wandered through the streets lit by varicolored lanterns, Looking on at the dancers who were executing skillful steps and boundings, and the astrologers who stood in the open air with their telescopes, then he came to the harbor, which was lit up by the resin torches of the fishermen who were fishing from their boats. The streets at last became quiet, and the patrol, the officers of which in their splendid costumes, and surrounded by their suites, Passepartout thought seemed like ambassadors succeeded the bustling crowd. Each time a company passed, Passepartout chuckled and said to himself, Good, another Japanese embassy departing for Europe. End of chapter 22「Around the World in Eighty Days」This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne, translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter 23, in which Passepartout's nose becomes outrageously long. The next morning poor jaded famished Passepartout said to himself that he must get something to eat at all hazards, and the sooner he did so the better. He might indeed sell his watch, but he would have starved first. Now or never he must use the strong, if not melodious, voice which nature had bestowed upon him. He knew several French and English songs, and resolved to try them upon the Japanese, who must be lovers of music, since they were forever pounding on their cymbals, tam-tams and tambourines, and could not but appreciate European talent. It was perhaps rather early in the morning to get up a concert, and the audience prematurely aroused from their slumbers might not possibly pay their entertainer with coin bearing the Mikado's features. Passepartout therefore decided to wait several hours, and as he was sauntering along it occurred to him that he would seem rather too well dressed for a wandering artist. The idea struck him to change his garments for clothes more in harmony with his project, by which he might also get a little money to satisfy the immediate cravings of hunger. The resolution taken, it remained to carry it out. It was only after a long search that Passepartout discovered a native dealer in old clothes, to whom he applied for an exchange. 
the man liked the European costume, and ere long Passepartout issued from his shop accoutred in an old Japanese coat and a sort of one-sided turban faded with long use. A few small pieces of silver, moreover, jingled in his pocket. Good, thought he, I will imagine I am at the carnival. His first care, after being thus Japaneseed, was to enter a tea-house of modest appearance, and upon half a bird and a little rice, to breakfast like a man for whom dinner was as yet a problem to be solved. Now, thought he, when he had eaten heartily, I must use my head. I can't sell this costume again for one still more Japanese. I must consider how to leave this country of the sun, of which I shall not retain the most delightful of memories, as quickly as possible. It occurred to him to visit the steamers which were about to leave for America. He would offer himself as a cook or servant in payment of his passage and meals. Once at San Francisco he would find some means of going on. The difficulty was how to traverse the 4,700 miles of the Pacific which lay between Japan and the New World. Passepartout was not the man to let an idea go begging, and directed his steps towards the docks. But as he approached them his project, which at first had seemed so simple, began to grow more and more formidable to his mind. What need would they have of a cook or servant on an American steamer? and what confidence would they put in him dressed as he was? What references could he give? As he was reflecting in this wise, his eyes fell upon an immense placard, which a sort of clown was carrying through the streets. This placard, which was in English, read as follows. Acrobatic Japanese Troop, Honorable William Batukler, Proprietor, Last Representations Prior to Their Departure to the United States of the Long Noses, long noses under the direct patronage of the god tingal great attraction the united states said passepartout that's just what i want he followed the clown and soon found himself once more in the japanese quarter a quarter of an hour later he stopped before a large cabin adorned with several clusters of streamers the exterior walls of which were designed to represent in violent colors and without perspective a company of jugglers. This was the Honorable William Battleker's establishment. That gentleman was a sort of Barnum, the director of a troupe of Montbanks, jugglers, clowns, acrobats, equilibrists, and gymnasts, who, according to the placard, was giving his last performances before leaving the Empire of the Sun for the States of the Union. Passepartout entered and asked for Mr. Battlecar, who straightway appeared in person. "'What do you want?' said he to Passepartout, whom he at first took for a native. "'Would you like a servant, sir?' asked Passepartout. "'A servant?' cried Mr. Battlecar, caressing the thick gray beard which hung from his chin. "'I already have two who are obedient and faithful, have never left me, and served me for their nourishment, and here they are.' added he, holding out his two robust arms, furrowed with veins as large as the strings of a bass vial. So can I be of no use to you? None. The devil! I should like to cross the Pacific with you. Ah, said the Honorable Mr. Battlecar, you're no more a Japanese than I am a monkey. Who are you dressed up in that way? A man dresses as he can. That's true. You are a Frenchman, aren't you? "'Yes, a Parisian of Paris.' "'Then you ought to know how to make grimaces.' "'Why,' replied Passepartout, a little vexed that his nationality should cause this question, "'we Frenchmen know how to make grimaces. It is true, but not any better than the Americans do.' "'True. Well, if I can't take you as a servant, I can as a clown. You see, my friend, in France they exhibit foreign clowns, and in foreign parts French clowns. Ah, oh, you are pretty strong, eh? Especially after a good meal. And you can sing? Yes, returned Passepartout, who had formerly been wont to sing in the streets. But can you sing standing on your head, with a top spinning on your left foot, and a saber balanced on your right? Hm, I think so, replied Passepartout, recalling the exercises of his younger days. Well, that's enough said the Honorable William Battlecar. 
The engagement was concluded there and then. Passepartout had at last found something to do. He was engaged to act in the celebrated Japanese troupe. It was not a very dignified position, but within a week he would be on his way to San Francisco. The performance so noisily announced by the Honorable Mr. Battlecar was to commence at three o'clock, and soon the deafening instruments of a Japanese orchestra resounded at the door. Passepartout, though he had not been able to study or rehearse a part, was designated to lend the aid of his sturdy shoulders in the great exhibition of the human pyramid executed by the long noses of the god Tingal. This great attraction was to close the performance. Before three o'clock the large shed was invaded by the spectators, comprising Europeans and natives, Chinese and Japanese, men, women, and children, who precipitated themselves upon the narrow benches and into the boxes opposite the stage. The musicians took up a position inside and were vigorously performing on their gongs, tam-tams, flutes, bones, tambourines, and immense drums. The performance was much like all acrobatic displays, but it must be confessed that the Japanese are the first equilibrists in the world. One with a fan and some bits of paper performed the graceful trick of the butterflies and the flowers. Another traced in the air with the odorous smoke of his pipe a series of blue words which composed a compliment to the audience, while a third juggled with some lighted candles which he extinguished successively as they passed his lips and relit them again without interrupting for an instant his juggling. Another reproduced the most singular combinations with a spinning top, in his hands the revolving tops seemed to be animated with a life of their own in their interminable whirling. They ran over pipe-stems, the edges of sabers, wires, and even hairs stretched across the stage. They turned around on the edges of large glasses, crossed bamboo ladders, dispersed into all the corners, and produced strange musical effects by the combination of their various pitches of tone. The jugglers tossed them in the air, threw them like shuttlecocks with wooden battledoors, and yet they kept on spinning. They put them into their pockets and took them out, still whirling as before. It is useless to describe the astonishing performances of the acrobats and gymnasts, the turning on ladders, poles, balls, barrels, and so on, was executed with wonderful precision. But the principal attraction was the exhibition of the long noses, a show to which Europe is as yet a stranger. The long noses form a peculiar company under the direct patronage of the god Tingal. Attired after the fashion of the Middle Ages, they bore upon their shoulders a splendid pair of wings. But what especially distinguished them was the long noses which were fastened to their faces and the uses which they made of them. These noses were made of bamboo, and were five, six, and even ten feet long, some straight, others curved, some ribboned, and some having imitation warts upon them. It was upon these bandages, fixed tightly on their real noses, that they performed their gymnastic exercises. A dozen of these sectaries of Tingal lay flat upon their backs, while others, dressed to represent lightning rods, came and frolicked on their noses, jumping from one to another and performing the most skillful leapings and somersaults. As a last scene, a human pyramid had been announced in which fifty long noses were to represent the car of Juggernaut, but instead of forming a pyramid by mounting each other's shoulders, the artists were to group themselves on top of the noses. It happened that the performer who had hitherto formed the base of the car had quitted the troupe, and as to fill this part only strength and adroitness were necessary, Passepartout had been chosen to take his place. The poor fellow really felt sad when, melancholy reminiscence of his youth, he donned his costume, adorned with varicolored wings, and fastened to his natural feature a false nose six feet long. But he cheered up when he thought that this nose was winning him something to eat. He went upon the stage and took his place beside the rest who were to compose the best of the car of Juggernaut. They all stretched themselves on the floor, their noses pointing to the ceiling. A second group of artists disposed themselves on these long appendages, then a third above these, 
then a fourth, until a human monument reaching to the very cornices of the theater soon arose on top of the noses. This elicited loud applause, in the midst of which the orchestra was just striking up a deafening air, when the pyramid tottered, the balance was lost, one of the lower noses vanished from the pyramid, and the human monument was shattered like a castle built of cards. It was Passepartout's fault, abandoning his position, clearing the footlights without the aid of his wings, and clambering up to the right-hand gallery. He fell at the feet of one of the spectators, crying, "'Ah, oh, my master! My master!' "'You are here?' "'Myself!' "'Very well. Then let us go to the steamer, young man.' Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Passepartout passed through the lobby of the theatre to the outside, where they encountered the Honourable Mr. Battlecar, furious with rage. He demanded damages for the breakage of the pyramid and Phileas Fogg appeased him by giving him a handful of banknotes. At half-past six, the very hour of departure, Mr. Fogg and Aouda, followed by Passepartout, who in his hurry had retained his wings and nose six feet long, stepped upon the American steamer. End of chapter 23